Thank you. Thanks. Let me make sure the mic's working. Is it working? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, I'm thrilled by this level of interest in, in nutrition, but I'm not suffering the conceit that the interest is about this and not the outside, uh, <laughs> what we're offering there. Still, I've got you captive for a little while, and I'm going to use that and offer you some tidbits and maybe your dessert here. When I was first asked by Dean Rome and Mark Lucas uh, to uh, get on the rack, I thought, is that a joke? Is this some medieval torture device? <laughs> but you know, this is the rack seminar series, the research uh, 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 administrators um, council of CC. Yeah. And, uh, and I was delighted because, you know, this powerful acronym, the, the RAC, uh, really is uh, a lot about what this university is about. We have a tremendous research portfolio at UCLA. We have a fantastic worldwide reputation. And really it is you RAs, your dedication, your passion, your humor, your tolerance, your patience, your getting things done with terribly disorganized scientists that need it on a terribly short deadline uh, always amazes us. It's, it's your work, your support that really makes us all look good. And so the least I could do is to uh, try to entertain you, or we all could do, with, with some glimpses, glimpses of what's coming out of all this. So I put together this talk. It's actually part of what I had delivered at the Linus Pauling Institute in uh, one of their large public lectures uh, a little while ago and try to meld that background about personalized nutrition with a little bit of a uh, taste of the, the research that we have going on right now. And so, um, you know, the interest in nutrition is really growing. There are so many foods and food components and the idea of personalized nutrition in most people's mind is that somehow we can achieve our genetic potential and reduce the risk of diseases if only we're uh, smart enough to figure that out. And there are a tremendous amount of components in our foods that can modify our health. I'm sure you're all doing pretty well with your essential nutrients, if not through your fruits, then through your vitamin supplements, which are very commonly taken. And then the phytochemicals, you know, those you're not going to get through vitamin supplements. Those are more basic in the food supply in our plant food supplies. But let's not forget the important animals that we eat and the fatty acids and the CLAs, the conjugated linoleic acid that we would only get from uh, things like milk products. Um, what about fungo chemicals? Those mushrooms do make a difference. And then we've got bacteriochemicals. We have things formed from the fermentation of food in our body. So there are lots of components of foods that are important. I personally love researching those that are good, the, the healthy foods, the ones that can prevent disease, the ones that can lower our risk of stroke, the ones that may be very important for survivors of cancer. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, do this, give you a little bit of the foundation of what we know about personalized nutrition, try to give you a little bit of a message of how you could personalize your nutrition after the fact for lunch, but in time for dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, tell you uh, about the, the two and a half million dollar study we had funded from the NIH that we're in the last year of conducting where we're trying to come up with ways to validly get dietary information, to figure out what people are eating. And it's really not easy to figure out what people are eating. Um, and we're doing this both for science of nutritional epidemiology where from which we get the connections between diet and disease, but also even more so to bring it to people and patients in very uh, specialized ways. So what do we know? Well, you know, let me start with the human genome. Uh, these 2.9 million uh, different genes are turned on. So on the carbohydrate diet, 176 are turned on that aren't turned on on the other diet. On the high protein diet, 778 that are turned on here that are not there and there are 141 that are in common turned on under both diets. So the genes are being affected by diet. Now do we have any indication if we get to harder outcomes that there is an interaction in man? Well, we have some uh, examples here from vitamin D receptor polymorphisms, that is people who have differences in their vitamin D receptors, and 
colon cancer and bone density. So I'll just show you two very quickly. Here, a population is broken down into those that get low calcium per day, under 388 milligrams. It's not that that's an important number, that's just where they broke up the population. Under 400 under, and over 400. And the colon cancer risk in those that have a certain genotype, the FF, is strongly impacted by the dietary calcium. So what we're seeing is one group is not impacted. Their risk does not depend upon their dietary calcium. The other group, their risk increases if you keep the calcium low. And that's risk of colon cancer. And we have uh, bone mass. Some people are caffeine sensitive and others are not. So this uh, vitamin D receptor polymorphism, they call TT, suffers most bone loss with high caffeine intakes. Okay, and that's caffeine over 300, that's about a cup a, a day. So that suggests that maybe, you know, some people are more vulnerable than others. Why don't we take the strategy we just give everyone a lot and we'll cover all our bases. There are some concerns about that as well. What if we don't tailor the advice, just say we are a rich country and we'll just supplement ourselves richly with nutrients. So I don't know, some of you may know the folic acid story that's been unfolding. Um, I know when I was a student, you know, everyone knew that folic acid was very important for neural tube defects and there was a tremendous drive to get supplementation in the population because you have to get to women in their first trimester and they don't even know they're pregnant in the first trimester. It's too late by the time they know they're pregnant to get the supplementation in place. So the concept was let's fortify the whole population because it is an important and expensive disease afterwards and what's you know, what, what's so difficult about giving a little extra folate? Maybe it may um, actually cover up anemia in elderly persons, but um, the, the decision was the benefit would way outweigh any risk. So um, we know that it has actually worked. There's been an increase, excuse me, a reduction in neural tube defects in incidence. Um, and it may decrease the incidence of early epithelial cell adenomas. But what we're seeing is that excess folic acid may actually promote colon cancer in individuals with pre-existing conditions, and it may also enhance breast cancer risk. And this data uh, came from a couple of different sources. One was a study where they gave folic acid and hoped they would reduce risk, and they actually saw an increase in adenomas in the supplemented group. Equally interesting was, this is a timeline of pre and post fortification. Uh, the rates of, uh, this here is colorectal cancer, going down in the US at, at, with, the with um, time, and then when we had fortification with folate, we saw this little blurb of it going up, and then it continued to go down. Well, that may not look like much, but that is a lot of cancer. And as a matter of fact, in Canada, they saw exactly the same thing. They fortified it a different year and saw exactly the same change. So it came, uh, arose the concern that maybe folate is not beneficial um, and maybe pushing forward, stimulating the growth of colon and, and breast cancer. And you're probably aware of the fact that the first uh, therapies to reduce leukemia in children were antifolates. Folate is needed for growth and cancers are fast growing cells. So anyway, we need to identify at risk periods in terms of identifying and personalizing recommendations. Okay, so that's some background saying, showing that something can be done of it. Now if you go on the web, you will find places that want to, if you pay them, take your blood <laughs> and, and tell you what your risks are, you know? And it sounds very compelling. You know, just take the blood and tell me what do I have to eat? What would my diet be? Um, and they'll give you this little printout that will say uh, the percentage of the population with this gene variation and what risk it is. These are actually vitamin D receptors and IL-6. And they'll say, you know, okay, very few people are in your group. You might need more of X, Y, or Z. These have come under, in, and this used to cost $126, I don't know what it costs now, 
um, used to, it came under tremendous scrutiny, and the GAO actually even issued a report examining these websites, and they said, the results we received from all the tests we purchased misled their consumer by making health-related predictions that are medically unproven and so ambiguous they don't provide meaningful information. That's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is we have so little information. The studies that are underlining this are usually so small that one study says folate matters, another study says it doesn't in those subsets. So we don't quite have the information base to have this be solid. Another part of the problem is this is talking about single polymorphisms, single genes, single SNPs, and that isn't how we work. It assumes that you've got one backup if you have one polymorphism and everything behind that, like in a sink or a toilet, is going to back up if you have a blockage and we can just drive through that. You know, a, a, a pathway that, that is linear and if you cut through in the middle here, you're going to have a, a backlog. But we're not that simple. We actually have a much more dynamic system and a dynamic flow. We are very smart creatures and if there's a backup somewhere, we're going to find another pathway. And so you would have to know combination of multiple polymorphisms to understand what is the effect of, of diet going to be in a single area. So we have networks and not highways. And I wish we had more networks here instead of highways. But uh, um, we are actually maybe light years away from understanding these network dynamics. So this puts us pretty far away from robust recommendations regarding nutrients for a specific genotype. So that sounds you know, pretty sad. Does that mean there is no way we can personalize our nutrition? If you were to look right now, you know, what are the most recent articles? Uh, here's one that just came out last month, or this month, evidence on obesogenes. Um, and this is uh, saying that about 40 to 70 percent of the variation in human obesity is, uh, it can be explained through genetic differences. But do we know how to approach that and design interventions? These authors are saying um, it may in the future be the case, but at present the best therapy appears to be modification of dietary habits and physical activity level. We're just not there yet. So how can you personalize your nutrition now? Well, you have all have been hearing the advice that's a little bit non-personalized. Michael Pollan's in defense of food saying, you know, three very simple things. Eat plants, eat, eat foods, and if your grandmother doesn't recognize it, it's not a food. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly plants, which is a very you know, wise thing, and not that much of it. So that, you know, that's the generic advice we're getting uh, right now. And we're getting lists of foods that are supposed to be really good for us. I've highlighted the broccoli, not because George Bush said I'm president, I don't have to eat broccoli, um, <laughs> but, but because we've done research on cruciferous vegetables, and we've become very aware of the fact that these are toxins. Our body treats them like they are toxins. And probably there is a side effect of that reaction to this goitrogen that reduces phase two enzymes, which are kind of like calling the fire department and saying, you know, there's a house on fire, send them there. And even though that fire really doesn't matter, there's another fire going on. And so the net effect is positive in small doses. But things like cruciferous vegetables are not things you'd want to be eating five times a day. There is a dose and there is a risk. Okay, but there are some of the genetics. Um, now, let me tell you briefly about five personalization strategies you could apply today to dinner. And one is to appreciate the genes of major importance. And we do actually know it's this one, your sex chromosome, OK? You don't have to have those genetic tests online. If you know if you're a man or a woman, <laughs> you know that this influences your risk of disease a lot and also what you should be eating. OK, let's go to the next one. Know what your future big risks are. You know how you're going to know that? You know, I did a little research on, um, on T and risk of stroke, where we showed a reduction in risk. And I would always get the question in a lay audience, when should I drink the tea? And I would say, right before your stroke. But, <laughs> but there are ways that we can look at the future, and they are by looking at the past. 
your family history. This is very, very important, very powerful way to know what, the, what your risks are. Disease in the family is the ultimate phenotypic expression. So if you know who your parents are, you can um, get at uh, a, a good history, and I would recommend everyone, you know, have that conversation with all of the uh, all of the living relatives that you have. Get it, keep it, update it, and pass it on to your kids. The third thing uh, you can do is be aware of that change over time. Personalizing your nutrition to your stage of disease now. Now I know that sounds pretty heavy. Stage of disease now. Um, I'm over 50. I think pretty much all of us that are over 50 have been initiated with uh, changes in our DNA towards cancer. Cancer is that prevalent as a disease, you know, and what happens from here depends on if we stimulate the growth or not. So um, in that light, you know, there are actually 25 million cancer survivors worldwide. There'll be 70 million by the year 2050. In the U.S., we have 10 million cancer survivors, 4% of our population. Remember the folate. Certain nutrients are really not good to take in excess if you are concerned about cancer growth. So personalize to where you are now. Avoid negative impacts on nutritional status. Hmm, what might they be? Well, one of them, I don't have a slide of it, might be cigarette smoking, which I'm sure no one in this room would do. I don't even see any of the e-cigarettes out there now. My son has one, unfortunately. But there's also this type of <laughs> negative impact on your nutritional status. Yeah, don't do it. This doesn't mean don't eat potatoes. This means <laughs> don't be the couch potato. Right. OK. And then uh, getting into what, what we're doing. You know, Be knowledgeable about your current nutritional status. Well, that sounds easy, but it's not. Um, so to know where you want to go at any given point in your lifespan, you need to know where you are. And how can you possibly know that? I've been on the National Academy of Science developing dietary recommendations for individuals. And you know those are really intense meetings where you have to come up with a number, because if you don't come up with a number, uh, you can't pin down food lunch programs. You can't uh, get uh, levels in vitamin tablets. You can't recommend um, exactly what people should be eating. So we spend a lot of time and effort and money arguing about the best number. And then we put it out there. and it's not of any use to people if they don't know where they are. You know, how many of you know how much zinc you're eating right now? How many know, if you're not taking supplements, how much calcium is in your food and how much you're getting over the course of the day? So this beautiful concept of the uh, Institute of Medicine that we have this distribution of nutritional needs and if you're on this half, you're you know, greatly likely to have enough and here's your, uh, your EAR, your, your uh, average required intake, you need to know that you're over here and that you need to be over here, but that requires knowing actually how much you're eating. So we get back to that problem of how do we know what we're eating. The World Cancer Research Fund spent about $7 million, came up with guidelines on what people should be eating that sound like this. Your energy expenditure should, um, uh, gee. Now, which is this one? Should be about 60, I think it's the rate, 60 calories per minute per day. Your energy density, uh, no, no, I'm, excuse me, you should be burning. You should be physically active 60 minutes a day. Your energy density should average 125 kilocalories per 100 grams of food. Well, can anyone, you know, how much kilocalories per 100 grams of pizza is there? It's, it's not a number that's at the tip of your tongue. Your non-starchy fruits and vegetables should be over 400 grams per day or 14 ounces per day. But even if we put it in ounces, you know, it's not that easy. And are we talking about liquid or dry? Are we talking about soups or juices? Or um, eh, your red meat should be under 11 ounces per week, by the way. That's per week. Yeah, under uh, per week. This is to prevent cancer. And you should have less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day. So 
clear recommendations difficult to follow unless we have some kind of printout and some kind of assessment of what we eat. Now, you might think it's easy to get it. You know, let's just write down what we eat all day and then we'll know what we eat. But some funny thing happens to you when you start writing down what you eat. No. No. Yeah, I, I actually wasn't going to eat that. No, you know, you start changing your diet. You don't get that snapshot that is unbiased. Actually, it's a great way to lose weight. Start writing down what you eat and you start eating less. So it is not a good objective way, and a lot of bad science has been built on the concept that that, that really works, because it doesn't. Um, and so the best thing that we know about to do right now, because we all have very short memories, is what you eat yesterday. That's about as far back as anyone can remember. As a matter of fact, even when we say this are the foods I ate yesterday, 30% of the food you ate yesterday you forget. 30% are phantom foods. You say you ate it, you didn't eat it yesterday. <laughs> now, what is that about? Well, you know, it, part of it is telescoping. Part of it is, you know, what is today? It's Wednesday, and oh, I ate that on Monday, if we really pin someone down. They just get their days mixed up. We all do. I don't know if any of you have read that uh, wonderful book, uh, The Invisible Gorilla, which I gave Lenny a copy of. You'll go away from that book not trusting your memory of anything anymore. It's, uh, it's really good. But anyway, this is what we use in the science because some other studies have shown it works better than anything else. It's really hard to uh, bias your results if we're talking about what people eat yesterday. So we came up with a computer program that is on the web that has lots of foods and food modules and basically asks you what you ate yesterday. And here's a little bit of what it, it looks like. Um, this is actually one version which we have designed particularly for kidney patients because they have the hardest time in the world. The diet that they're supposed to maintain with low protein and low potassium are very, very challenging. And, you know, there's where you go in and you check off the food groups that you ate at a given part of the day and little arrows come up. And what kind of salads, you know, used to be we were just asked to eat salad and we would assume it was mixed salad, but we've learned, you know, there's potato salads and jello that people consider <laughs> salads and taco salad. And so we've got a lot of things under this salad name. And, you know, and then, you know, you can pick in, in Japanese foods and then you'll get to this part of the program. We'll say, okay, we're not going to ask you how many grams or how many ounces. We're going to show you pictures. and. And you say, you know, which of these is it that represents your food? Right, right. And, you know, that goes for other foods as well. Okay. And we know that we can't get at someone's diet without asking supplements. So there are about, you know, a thousand different supplements that are included here. And at the end of this, we create a personal report. We learned early on in our science that we overload people with information. They really don't want everything. So we put it in a binder and we said, okay, you can flip to whatever chapter you want. You can look at your vitamins, and interestingly, we see women are really into vitamins. You can look at their minerals, and men seem to be much more into their minerals. I want to know my zinc, I want to know my selenium. Um, you know, we've got the macronutrients. <laughs> we've learned a lot of interesting uh, gender-related findings from this. I'll tell you another one later. Um, antioxidants, then it will tell you where are you low and what could you eat that would compensate for that. And it will also tell you which are, might be excessive. Where are you above the upper limits? So we give a personalized report. And this is a design that we've come up with when we've asked physicians, if you did spend that minute with a patient on their diet, what would you want it to look like? And they want it color coded, you know, red, green, uh, yellow. And, you know, one sheet of paper and no more than three goals. So this is designed around that. Are they compliant, non-compliant, and what are the couple of things we could talk to them about? But the whole report has the whole thing. In this case, where we're talking about uh, kidney disease patients, you know, let's say they clicked on sodium, then they would see in this individual their sodium's coming from, you know, 65% from the soup and so much from the muesli and so on. Okay, so that's the type of, um, of study uh, excuse me, that's the type of instrument we were testing uh, to try to get at, at better dietary information. And we were funded by the NIH to look at the validity of this approach, but also its technical and human feasibility. 
So the system is on the web. We tell people, go to the web and do it. And when we wrote the first grant, we said we would have people do it three times. And then after that, someone at NIH came to me and said, oh, you don't have enough data with three of them. You ought to ask them to do it more than that. And we thought, no, people aren't going to do it more than that, and it's too expensive to ask them. But actually, it isn't expensive to ask them. You send them an email. You can automate the email, send them an email, say, you know, here, do it today. And so we tried to ask them eight times to show in our scientific reports when that decay curve occurs. How many do they, you know, after how many days do they stop doing it? So we were looking at things like this. Does the system work? Is it stable? Can we get people to the web? Will they do it repeatedly? And will they uh, respond to impromptu emails? Because we don't want to tell them do it, you know, that Monday and that Thursday. They might behave better on the days beforehand and give you a biased view of their diet. Okay, so this is the energetic study. Um, and we took 250 African Americans and Caucasians from LA uh, in this study. We actually asked them to do eight of these recalls and then some other dietary methods to compare with them. But our important comparison were with very expensive biomarkers, which are supposed to be telling us the truth. No matter what they say they eat, this is saying exactly how much they do eat. And then we asked some people to do it six months later because we thought there might be seasonality. And it, it is um, a study that's the uh, only doubly labeled water study that is non-white and the only one with younger people. There are four doubly labeled water studies of this size in the world right now. They're all being pooled. Okay, and one of our first publications was whether it's feasible to do this. And so we asked people, how difficult was it for you to do this, uh, to repeat this eight times? And 80% said it was easy, and we saw no uh, major difference by, uh, by race. Uh, we saw that the African Americans, 83% said it was easy, and the Caucasians, 79%. What we did see was that we were getting 85% of the people to do it at least six times. We were really surprised. We really thought they're for three times and that's it. Now, we didn't only ask them once. We did you know, say, oh, you missed doing it then, and we reminded them again. And there we found something else very interesting. We wrote a little uh, report and presented experimental biology of what is the effect of nagging. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we saw that women are driven by guilt and men are driven by shame. <laughs> yes. So women, if you said, you, you know, you'd say to them, you say you'd do it, but you forgot. You know, would you please do it? You'll get a huge number of the women that were late the first time to do it the second time. And if that subset that didn't, you do it one more time, you're going to get almost all the women over the hill to have done it. And the rest, you can beat them to death. They're never going to do it. You are off their radar. <laughs> Men, nag them and they'll do it. Every additional <laughs> nag brought up the compliance higher. So we think that's a very valuable piece of research and useful information for you to take home. So we, we asked them to do eight or more. We didn't ask them to do nine or more. So some of them just didn't stop doing it. We had some of them that were doing it 17 times. You know, I, we, this, so actually, you know, this was an important finding, that you can use the web for multiple numbers of days. Now we're looking at how many days do you really need. But we also saw that the method is quite valid. Now I don't know what this, you know, spots or uh, measles looks like to you, but basically it's showing that we have a pretty good correlation. Actually this is as good as it gets, and the variation that's in here can be adjusted statistically in funny ways so that when we use this type of method for a study, we get a relative risk of two, we know it's really a six. It's just statistical magic that goes behind it. But basically, this is a strong validity on reported energy intake. We did, however, see that the average from the first day of report is the highest, and the average tends to go down with additional days. So people were doing it, but they maybe have gotten a little tired of doing it, and so they report a little bit less food. So we thought, this means it's going to get less valid. But surprisingly, Something funny is going on there. The more we take the mean of two days and three days and four days, the more we get a better validity that peaks right around here 
uh, a mean of four days taking the two to six day, and I'm not going to explain that to uh, esoteric why we did different sets of days. But there we saw we're getting as good as it gets a plateau at about this many days. Um, what we did see, and we were thrilled because there are very few studies that have validated dietary assessment tools in African Americans. Our African Americans, day two, pew, they were at the ceiling. They were really uh, at the peak of validity, and it was our Caucasians that were needing more days to get to this. Now, the first question might come up is, was the diet more homogeneous? But it wasn't. It wasn't. We were just getting more validity with fewer days there. Uh, we did see that there is an age effect. Yes, the 30-year-olds are really doing better at this web-based tool than the 30 to 50-year-olds and the over 50-year-olds. Yeah, yeah, we need to figure out how to get this group up. But here it's working fabulously. And I don't have the scale on it, but you know, here we had a 0.4 for the whole group. This is really going up to 0.6 and on a scale of uh, 0 to 1. Okay, and then uh, this is also a little esoteric, you know, do weekends matter? People always used to believe that weekends are important. You've got to take two days during the week and one on the weekend. In this study, we saw that actually three weekdays were outperforming and adding a weekend. And we were puzzled by that. And we saw that, you know, those under 30-year-olds, they don't have weekends and weekdays. They just eat. They, yes, it's not a big, there's not this rhythm that, oh, this is what we eat during the week and this is what we eat on the weekend. <laughs> Didn't matter. Weekends, weekdays, same thing. But the over 50-year-olds, they are in that old school of weekday is one set of, you know, way of eating and the weekends are different. And if we add the weekends in, their validation goes down. So their weekend eatings are more noise more unusual, taking more away from their usual behavior. Anyway, just some of ours. So we concluded that uh, even though eating may differ on weekends, this may be noise, and weekends can hurt more than help in those uh, older individuals that we're studying. We also saw women outperform men. I had to show you that one. Yeah. Um, and so can we use the web for this kind of thing? We, well, the answer we're seeing from this study is clearly a yes for Angelinos both African-American and Caucasian, younger outperforming the older, the younger meaning under 30, older is our 50 plus, and women are outperforming men. But it's working. It's working for both. OK, so getting back to you know that, well, how are you going to personalize? Because that was just saying be knowledgeable of your current status. And this is one opportunity for you to go and check out your status. Um, I saw one diagram in this paper by Rideout that was also just published this this month, current opinions in lipidology, uh, that you know points out there are the genetic factors. They're great. We'll learn more about them. We don't know how much this will explain things, but maybe even more important are the physiological factors. You know, clearly environmental factors: smoking, disease, and diet, uh, ex exercise, and the pathological factors that are affecting responses uh, to lipids. And there's one illustration I wanted to show you of this isn't a gene, but C-reactive protein. It's used very widely. And a recent study showed that people who have low CRP are more sensitive to a low-fat diet. Their triglycerides sink the most on a low-fat low diet. And there would be an analogous image to this, that people who have higher CRP are more positively responsive to a, a moderate-fat, high PUFA diet. So we're also beginning to tease out uh, what would be best for you in ways like this. OK, so I'm going to conclude and then take some questions. About personalized nutrition, ideally, this would be genotype. This is not ready for showtime yet. But also providing tailored recommendations on optimal intakes at each point of our lives, there are certain steps that we can already undertake in making sure we are as grounded as we can be in the dietary needs we have at present. And so I wanted to make sure um, to recognize the many, many people that were involved in the energetics study. And Katie is with us, even though she's left our group and gone on to medical school. Lorena is a study manager right now with the website. We have some local talent, Harry Hahn, and a group in Chicago that are supporting the website. Our RA was led by Mark before he left us. I hope it wasn't our study that drove him crazy. <laughs> He's now at the Cancer Center. 
And Rhonda was very involved with it when she was in GIM, and Scarlett is, is uh, supporting us now. And then we have a um, statistical group and had great support from the wonderful Clinical Research Center, the GCRC. And Lori's still here. Yeah. She was helping us all along the way with all of us. Can we do this to our subjects? And can they do that? And, you know, we ran to her when one of them actually ate the tablets that were in the urine collection bottle. And <laughs> it, was like, it was a wonderful study. And the uh, doubly labeled water. So a heartfelt thanks to all of you that make our research possible. And I hope you've enjoyed and learned a little bit about this. And